Grab a cup of tea or listen as you go, ladies. This is your hour with Dr. Zoe, your life and relationship coach, with encouragement, on point insight, inspiring guests, health tips, and advice. Dr. Zoe helps busy women keep their mind in the game by redefining your superwoman. You're listening to The Dr. Zoe Show. Hey, you guys out there driving your cars to work or working out or cleaning your house or just relaxing with a cup of tea and listening to the show. Welcome to The Dr. Zoe Show, redefining your superwoman. I'm your host, Dr. Zoe. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with a doctorate in clinical psychology. I'm a life and relationship coach and a motivational speaker, and I can work with you virtually to help you get unstuck. My passion is to help women find their superpower, learn to embrace it, and share it with the world. You can connect with me by texting the word JOIN to 38470 or go to my website at drzoeshaw.com. So today's topic is developing sex positivity in kids, and we will get to that in just a minute. My superwoman win... I am raising a maverick, which totally goes in line with what we're talking about today a little bit because we're talking to Emily Goudreau, who is the host of Raising a Maverick podcast. I've had her on the show before. So my win is I'm raising a maverick. My five-year-old, my baby flew all by herself from Maryland to California. One of my core values is independence, and I am so excited that I'm fostering fearlessness in my children. I really am purposeful in that because I see so many adults who are constrained with fear and ideas that I can't do that or I would never do that. My mother instilled some of that in me, that whole, you know, fearlessness, I guess, on some levels, not on all levels. But I remember when I was in college, and I'm sure there were times before that, but I remember I was in college and I was kind of struggling a little bit. And my mom and I were on a little trip. I think she'd come down to visit me when I was running a track meet in Florida or something. And we kind of spent the weekend together, which was really nice. She encouraged me to go bungee jumping, which is kind of crazy because I was scared, which is also why I jumped out of a plane many years later to get over my fear or not necessarily get over it, but conquer it. Anyway, my mom encouraged me to bungee jump. Now, funny thing is, my mom has plenty of fears, and she would never do this, but she did make sure she encouraged her kids to not have her own hangups. So my daughter, five-year-old, she went to visit my mom, her grandma, and our grandmommy is what we call her, and my sister, which is so nice. And I was scared for her, and this little girl, man, she got on the plane, she came, you know, came back to California. She actually went there with my mom and my mom put her on the plane and she flew here. Now, of course, when a minor that young is flying, there is a stewardess who's kind of assigned to them. So she's not just like out into the world, but it's kind of big to just throw your kid on a plane, you know? So she did it and she loved it. She had such a great time. She said she spoke to the lady next to her. She probably talked the lady's head off. <laughs> But she enjoyed herself and has such a sense of accomplishment that she was able to do that. So I'm proud. I'm proud of that. My superwoman fail. So if you remember, I think it was last episode, I was talking about my fail being my over-reliance on technology. I was over-relying on my period tracker app and ended up getting tons of tests I didn't need and going to the doctor. But anyway, so I was saying that my fail was over-reliance. And now this week, see, here's the deal. When it comes to that pendulum, you should not be in the practice of swinging that pendulum back and forth because you're just swinging it from dysfunction to dysfunction. You want to stay in the middle. And I say that as I swung the pendulum the other way. And I actually flaked on the interview with Emily Goudreau. So we had this interview scheduled before, but I saw her name on my calendar and I thought that must be wrong because we already had the interview. I'd forgotten that we had another one set up. And so I just deleted it and didn't even think anything of it until I get the call like 20 minutes into what should have been our interview, not a call. I think she emailed me and I realized, oh yeah, I didn't believe my calendar. I thought my calendar was lying to me and I should know better because it actually doesn't really, you know, lie. So anyway, 
Last week was over reliance. Now under reliance, I should have just said, you know what? It's in my calendar. I really do have an appointment instead of second guessing my technology. So there you go. And on to our topic today, which is developing sex positivity in kids. So I have to just say, this one is really a difficult topic. I wanted to do this because it's so important to recognize what we're passing on to our children, to be intentional about our passing on of our beliefs and our desires and our wisdom onto our kids. And sometimes, especially when it comes to sex, we are just not that intentional. We kind of just, all logic goes out of our heads sometimes. We aren't sure what to say or how to say it. We get nervous. We kind of flubber around and just don't know what to say. And Emily used this quote, and I'm going to quote it now at the beginning And she's going to quote it later at the end. But this was a quote from a pedophile. If you give me a child who doesn't know about sex, you've given me my next victim. I think that in and of itself says why this topic is so important. Two reasons. To keep your children safe when they know and are aware and confident in their body parts and their sexuality, then it helps them to keep safe. And then number two is the ultimate goal, which we talked about, is that your children will have healthy sexual relationships in their marriages. I think it's a great topic, and we kind of went kind of all over the place with it. But the goal, of course, is developing sex positivity in our kids. And, you know, everybody has different ideas. And sex is a sticky topic. And I didn't agree with everything Emily said. And you might not agree with everything Emily said. You might not agree with everything I said. And that's okay. I think what's important is that you listen and that you start opening up your eyes and just thinking about maybe new kind of ways that you can address this with your kids and why. So I hope you enjoy developing sex positivity in your kids. Thank you so much, Emily, for being on the show. It's number two, our second time. I love having guests come back because I already know it's going to be good. Thank you. I'm going to take that you know it's going to be good is like a little (laughs) bit of pressure there. No pressure. (laughs) No no pressure. (laughs) Raising a Maverick was awesome. And I got so much from the show. And I know that my listeners did too because they wrote me and told me about some things that they were doing to work on a little more free range with their kids. Nice. Yeah. Actually, one of my listeners, (laughs) her son cut his finger on a knife she let him have. It happens. It does. And you know what? He's fine. He's absolutely yep. fine. So there you go. And you know what? As an adult, uh, you know, those mandolin slicers, you know, I've cut my hand a lot oh, yeah. too. Oh my so, and we, you know what? We all survive. <laughs> we do. We do. Cuts, burns. Oh, yeah. So today we are going to be talking about developing sex positivity in our children. Such an awesome topic. Yeah, I have so, 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 so much to say about this. You know, prepping for this was really kind of cathartic. So thank you. Um, (laughs) Because I meditate. Well, I say meditate, like I meditate with a notebook next to me. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. That's fine. (laughs) Like if if I was at like a Zen retreat, they'd probably smack me on the back of a stick or something. (laughs) They'd say it doesn't count, but I say it totally counts. Anything you call meditation counts in my book. So before we get started, I have to ask you your superwoman win and your superwoman fail. Please share. And it can't be the same one as last time. So I'm cheating. (laughs) Yeah. So the Superwoman win for me was this past weekend, I did a photo shoot raising money to bring sex education to single mothers in the theme of sex abuse prevention because single moms are their kids are three times more likely to be abused. So they need the information first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So my history, I used to be a commercial photographer. I used to work for Rachel Ray. I photographed Bill Gates. I've traveled all over the world. I can't remember if I told your folks this. Anyways, I have, I have anxiety when I pick up my camera. (laughs) Really? So I, yeah, I just went from like, Oh, little girl taking photos of flowers in the quiet in the woods to progress in my career. And I'm literally standing on a ladder with a megaphone directing a creative team and oh. models. And it's just really high stress and a lot right. of money. And if I don't get the shot, 
it's all on me. The pressure. <laughs> yeah. Big pressure. So like as a little photo therapy, I rented a studio here in Denver mm-hmm. and it's all natural light. So I don't worry about lighting or anything like that. And mm-hmm. I decided to do this fundraiser. So you could come and get photos of your kids done for like a hundred oh. bucks, whatever. So it was really good because it was photographing in a totally different way. I never shot with natural light. It was always the dog and pony show with all the mm-hmm. strobes and lighting. And it was awesome. And the photos turned out really, really good. And I feel like I've kind of moved past my weird <laughs> phobia that, that I developed. Yeah, that is great. What a wonderful win. And I mean, you killed two birds, right? I mean, you have yeah. people, you're working on your phobia. Wow. Yeah. And if anybody wants to see the shots, I'm putting a few of them up on how to raise a maverick Instagram. So you can kind of see like they're the opposite of what I used to photo, which is nice. So they're really light and bright and cute kids. And (laughs) beautiful. well, we will put that link in the show notes and what you, what you described is called flooding in the psych world, you know, where you continue to expose Uh yourself to, and actually in kind of an intense way to something you're very scared of. And that's one technique that can sometimes be helpful for getting over a fear. So awesome. Oh, good. Okay. I'll use it more often. (laughs) Good job. Good job. (laughs) Okay. So on to your superwoman fail. Okay. So I started photographing like in 97 Mm -hmm. and there's only been one time that I've ever had a media card get zapped. So after you do a photo shoot, like the other time that it happened, I was photographing this woman, her name was Black Widow or something. She's just like expert snooker pool player. Uh And I put my flash on my camera and the electricity zapped the camera and zapped my media card. And And I had like everything ish because I had to go through all this like hacking software to get the images. The other time it happened was this weekend. Oh. <laughs> so I photographed 18 people in one day oh and um, I have this little thing on the back of my phone. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a magnet and it hooks kind of onto a ball bearing on your dashboard uh-huh. and it zapped my media card. How so I that? went, oh no, it was so horrible. So I came home. I was so excited to show everybody my photos and I, I put it in and it was a, you know, no files. I put it back in the camera, no files. And I just was like, this is why I'm not a photographer. Oh. <laughs> so it kind of like all that stress kind of added up. I recovered the files. I ran a bunch of like hacked software to like fix it. I have the photos. Everything is fine. Oh, but my epiphany was, I felt like it was like a message from the universe that my mission is to save kids from Mm. sexual abuse, Mm -hmm. not to be going back into the commercial world of photography, Mm -hmm. um, which is a really easy money place for me. And if I'm going to be photographing, I should be doing pure expressional art. Mm. It was a process. (laughs) Well, it was a fail, but the thing is when you learn from your fails, whether you learn more about yourself or you learn more about something else, it's really a win, just right. a different kind of way. So yeah. Yeah. So I, I came out unscathed, but like a little bit of pride brush there. And mm-hmm. now I'm like, go do your artwork. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. Thank you for sharing with us. Okay. So I've been looking forward to this topic, even though, as I talked about in my superwoman fail, I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> But I enjoyed oh. our first and the episode where Emily was, I don't have the number right now in my head, but it was How to Raise a Maverick, which is also the title of your podcast, correct? Yes. 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 And we, I was a really great episode. So I, let's dive into this. How okay. did you get involved in really focusing and knowing that your passion was preventing child abuse and kids or sexual abuse? And how did the sex positivity part come in? The moment I realized that this was my calling, and I say calling because it's not something that you really want to like waller in, you know, it's a a tough subject. Uh So I was in my kitchen and I was doing the recycling and I was cleaning out the things like cleaning out the peanut butter. And I was getting like, really like, I don't care about this. Mm -hmm. I like bad attitude. (laughs) I'm like, Emily, what is going on with you? Like, 
do the recycling. It's the right thing to do. And I kind of thought about it for a while and kind of meditated. (laughs) (laughs) And I realized, you know, I had been learning about the human trafficking and all that kind of stuff going on. And I was like, I don't care if the world goes to hell in a handbasket right now. If we are doing horrible things to our kids, Mm. I don't care if we survive. Like planet earth is going to keep going. It's the human race that might not make it. (laughs) You know, I was like, oh, that's your calling. Put the recycling down and like go forth and cause change. (laughs) I love it. And you know, when, when you really put your priorities in line and when you find that passion, that thing you're supposed to do, it is pretty amazing how all the other stuff just doesn't really matter. You're yeah. focusing on the important stuff. So that's awesome. I love to talk to people who are walking in their purpose and passion because that is how they feel yeah. about the world. You know, it's like you just rise above all that little stuff that just doesn't really matter in the world. So yeah. I love that. And you know what? I had kind of a pivotal moment. Tony Robbins does coaching. Mm-hmm. And the little bit that I got out of the coaching is he focused on successful people who reached their goals. And what was the difference between them and those who didn't? And he said, those that do focus 20% on the mechanics and 80% mm. on their why. Yes. I love that. You know, and it took me a little while because I am so mechanically focused. I was like, I get focusing on the mechanics. I don't get focusing on your why. Like, what does that look like? And then it just what's my why? I want to save kids from sexual abuse. And then I'm like, oh, there's no barrier now. I'm like, I'll do anything. Like it's, I focus on what I'm trying to accomplish. Then the, oh, well, I'll do a little website that's got this thing and all these little things, you know, Yeah. like, no, move right to the top, get money, get funds, get this executed. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful. So I've had a, a pretty big paradigm shift. That's awesome. So how does sex positivity, well, first let's talk about what that means because I was even looking up the definition and, you know, I think there's an adult definition and then also, I (laughs) also, I think the definition is different for everyone. And so when we're focusing on our kids, what would you say your definition of sex positivity is and how does fostering this in your child prevent child abuse? Yeah, don't necessarily look up sex positivity because it's used a lot for a lot broader range Mm -hmm. with like sexual exploration. Mm -hmm. But what I specifically focus on is I call it positivity, not complexity, which is kind of the opposite of how the internet is probably using it. But when it comes to our kids, it's them kind of reaching their point where they are in a loving relationship and they are ready to make love. And I say that very specifically because it's not just a hookup. They have a positive association with sexuality being an expression of love. So when you talk to your kids about sexuality, there's a couple different ways. And first, I'm going to dive into the practical side is to speak about the anatomically correct parts it's very nonchalant. It's no big deal. Don't, as my nanny says, she cheeses out. She's like, oh my gosh, I just cheese. I can't say, I can't say that, (laughs) you know, just try. I'm going to stop you there for a second because I was thinking about this as I was thinking about this topic that we're talking about. And my question is, what are your sexual hangups? Because you're Mm. going to pass them down to your kids. Yep. And even just as you said, your nanny can't say the words Wow. You know, what does that say about us and what we're passing down to our children if we feel so uncomfortable with the actual real words about our bodies, you know? Yes. So yes. Thank you for, for even just mentioning that because I think in my definition of sex positivity, part of it is recognizing your own hangups, which are probably there. We all have them in some, oh, yeah. you know, sense, some fashion and working on not passing those down to your children. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I actually have that kind of written down, Uh but it's to have a notebook. And when you feel triggered Mm, yes, to take note of that. And also another thing that's really, really important is when you feel yourself being triggered, which it'll happen, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's just certain things that kids do where you're like, oh, my kid's going to be a pervert, you know, <laughs> just take a moment and 
just either walk away, but you've really got to like take some time and write about that and really think about it and think about how you're going to respond to it. So just literally physically remove yourself from the situation as long as everybody is safe. So when you're talking about the genitalia, just yes. use the anatomically correct words, use the names for the external female genitalia, vulva, labia, clitoris. And that's important because those parts, mostly a lot of people just refer to the female parts as the vagina, right. which is like a quarter it's not even acknowledging the external part. And I'm so glad you said that because the last time we spoke, you mentioned that, I think. And I had always just referred to it as vagina when I'm talking to my daughter. Although I did one time because she was asking me about like, what's this, mom? And so then I did actually yeah, label yeah. the parts of her vagina, but it's not something that I do regularly. But since then, I have made sure to do that. So thank you for Yay. that. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and the other part that's important about it is that is where the sensations come from and Mm -hmm. that sex is pleasurable. And that's a big part of our sexuality is we, you know, this isn't just a practical thing. You know, it ups our, is it oxytocin or whatever to bond? I think that's where you could probably talk more about that, but it is a bonding agent. Yep. Yeah. It creates attachment and there's, you know, love that orgasm. And that, I mean, that we were talking about kids, but like you've, it's all part of the big piece. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully some, at some point they will have an orgasm and it will bond them with the person that they are making love to. So anyways, mm-hmm. <laughs> so be super relaxed, matter of fact, and again, take note of what's triggering you. And the other thing that I really want people to do is check out Sex Needs a New Metaphor by Al. I'm going to butcher his name. I think it's Vernacino. Alvar Nacino, and he changes the metaphor of talking about sex from baseball, like first base, second base, um, making it like this competitive thing. It's fabulous. And then more into pizza where it's like this communal thing and we both want to enjoy it and it's not competitive. And, you know, sometimes you want pizza, a lot of pizza, and sometimes you eat too much and you feel gross. (laughs) Um, I like that. But I want to go back to what you were saying, and I I want to make this emphasis for our listeners is that the ultimate goal, what you said, and teaching and helping our children explore their sexuality in a positive way is for them to have a positive sexual experience. And for me, you know, I want my kids to have a loving experience sexual experience in their marriage. And Mm -hmm. I know how healthy that can be. Crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Crucial. And so if you think of it from that point of view, that your goal is for your kids to have great, amazing, loving sex with their Mm -hmm. spouse, I see a lot of parents who are fearful that their kids are going to have sex before marriage or their kids are going to have sex too soon. And what they do is they create these fears around sex Mm -hmm. and they create this idea that, you know, sex is bad, of course. And it's about their fear because they're trying to protect their child. But what they don't realize is that all of those things that you're planting into your children aren't going to go away the day they get married. It's not going to disappear when Mm -hmm. they are finally in that relationship that, you know, they need to have a healthy sexual relationship in. And so you have to be able to recognize that being positive about sex with your child is not going to make them run out and try to have sex with everybody. Hmm. Yeah, definitely not. In fact, there's a lot of studies in the Netherlands because of the Netherlands, they raise, I mean, they've got some other interesting things going on there. I know Mm -hmm. that for sure, but they raise their kids. It's extremely sex positive, very unjudgmental. Mm -hmm. They talk about sex kind of like it's breakfast cereal. It's Mm -hmm. no big deal. They talk about their relationships and they actually, they start becoming sexually active the same time American kids do. So you need to encourage kids to wait until they are in love. And it's kind of, it's just tricky territory. Cause it's like, I know there's a lot of, it's so many triggers. Yeah. People, and there are know? a lot of triggers and um, I want to absolutely respect that because, you know, I would love for my kids to wait until marriage. And I know there are a lot of people that would also yeah. love for their kids to wait until marriage. But like you said, I mean, there's so many things that go along with that because of our society. And, you know, my fear 
for people who do choose to wait until marriage, and I spoke with somebody else about this, is that they get married to have sex and they're not, they're not Mm -hmm. getting married for reasons, you know, that are good, that are healthy, that are, are choosing a partner. But that's a whole nother topic again. But I think what you're saying is, and you know, I was going to do this, um, I'm working on this project with a friend called Wait, actually, and it is about encouraging teenagers to wait to have sex because there's plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there, you know, there's some emotional maturity that needs to happen. But I just want to respect those who are listening who do want their, their children to wait to have sex. But I want to make sure, wait until marriage, I want to make sure that we're also recognizing that in that process, you have to encourage healthy sexual development in your child. Right. Exactly. I think honestly, most parents would prefer that their kids wait, (laughs) but just really stressing sex is given to us. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from the universe. It's a superpower. It really is. And we make love, we attach, we create bonds. The reason why a lot of the religious texts say that you should be monogamous is because of the bond that you can have with one person if you do have a good sexual relationship and without. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of variants in there, but Mm -hmm. and to create a child from making love. Mm -hmm. That's the intention is for it to be this amazing gift from God in the universe. So a good way to help kids understand this is just creating kind of what I'm going to call like raising and being children of the light. And Mm -hmm. what I mean by that, and this is falls outside of or outside and inside of all religious beliefs, Mm -hmm. but it's, are you creating positive energy or negative energy in the world? Exactly. Yes. And it's very, very simple. It's like morality at like the most simple level. We all make mistakes, but is your intention to create positive energy. And when you're involved in a hookup culture like America is right now, it takes us, the level of light in our country and around the world is dimming because of this, because Mm -hmm. of the lack of love. I don't know if I'm fully answering. I've got so much to say about all this. I don't know (laughs) if I'm answering the sex positive stuff, but there is a really wonderful TED talk by Helen Fisher Uh And she talks about the mix or the problem with being on antidepressants is it reduces your sex drive, reduces your chances of having an orgasm, obviously, which reduces your attachment. Mm. So that's kind of what's spurring on the hookup culture. And kids now, there's a kind of an image that you can imagine in your mind is, you know, Adam and Eve covering their genitals when God comes into the... Uh, with a fig leaf or, you know, of Roman art or whatever. Nowadays, imagine them nude with the fig leaves over their faces. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's easier to have a one night stand than it is to be emotionally intimate. Mm -hmm. We have such, I mean, it is, it's rampant. And when you shut down your emotional intimacy and the process of sex, you are damaging, you are damaging yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I think just from the get-go, the moment you have your child, just start dealing with your own hangups. What our parents said, I mean, they could have overshared, they could have undershared, they could have said some horrible things, there might have been abuse, Mm -hmm. shamed, all that kind of stuff. This is another interesting thing with sexuality that's hard is because our genitalia are in our area where we defecate and urinate. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like, <laughs> it's, I, I heard like, somebody why say- Why did God make it that way, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like putting like a trash processing or a waste processing plant next to like the nicest restaurant, you know? Right. So there are moments where, you know, your child has their hand in their pants and you're like, go wash your hands, that's dirty. In those types of situations, you need to also kind of back it up. If you touch yourself, you also need to wash your hands before you touch yourself because that's a special place. Oh, I see. So you need to wash your hands before you touch yourself and wash your hands after you touch yourself. Yes. Kind of include both because it's a special place. Okay. So it kind of like 
balances out the weirdness of you need, you were touching yourself, you have to wash your hands. Mm -hmm. And also that's a special place you really need to take care of. So you Mm -hmm. need to wash your hands before you touch yourself. I like that. It's a hard one to balance because I mean, it's like, please do not put your hand in your pants and then grab my hamburger. Like, oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Which kids will do. Yes, Yes, they will. (laughs) Totally, totally do that. Getting back to the sex positive. So a mom yeah. is out there and thinking about, okay, well, yeah, maybe I do have some hangups and I really don't want my kids to have my hangups. And I really want to raise my kids so that they can be in that place where they're entering, you know, their relationship in a wonderful, positive way sexually. What are some other tips I can do? One really great thing to do, especially with the younger kids, is to talk about sexuality as a superpower. Because I'm going to get back to the superpower in just a second. But the reason we need to kind of emphasize that is because as a sex abuse prevention educator, Mm -hmm. it's very like, oh, this is private. Nobody should touch it. If anybody ever touches you, you need to tell me. And there's a lot of fear and angst about that part of their body being touched, Mm -hmm. which of course, as kids, you're like, everybody hands off, Mm -hmm. but we're wiring them at that age as well that it's being hardwired that I shouldn't be touched. So sometimes that can go too far. Then it also creates, it shouldn't be touched. Therefore, that sounds like something really fun to do. I'm going to go do that because I'm not supposed to do that. Right, right. It could go either way. Yes. And I've seen it go both ways for sure. Yeah. So the thing that I suggest is to talk about the sexuality as a superpower. And a lot of superheroes can have their power taken away. I think like the Incredible Hulk was Mm -hmm. one. Captain America had his power taken away. Wonder Woman for like social political reasons, they tried to take her power away and make her Mm -hmm. calm and whatever. And also your superpower can be used for good and evil, Mm -hmm. just like the superheroes. So it's something that you need to protect and use for positive. Love it. And be very, very careful because it's very powerful. And you, you are very vulnerable, like Superman and kryptonite and that kind of thing. This is not to be shared. Just like Superman wouldn't just openly vulnerably say, okay, you know, whoever has kryptonite or whatever, I, you know, I am definitely not up on my superheroes. I'm sorry if there's somebody out there. (laughs) I'm getting it though, because I'm not up on my superheroes either. So it sounds perfect to me. (laughs) I think this is a good audience to be, to show my ignorance in that area, but (laughs) No, but I I get your point. I love that because it's putting your sexuality in a positive way, but also respecting it because of its power and explaining to both girls and boys that your sexuality is very powerful. And I love that you can use it for good or for evil and that there is kryptonite, you know, as a part of it because you Mm -hmm. can be hurt and you can hurt others and that's not okay. And so you do have to protect yourself and Um, protect other people. Yes. Yeah. And to call it out when it's being misused Mm, and to be it. Yes. Yeah. Being a child of the light and is this positive or negative energy? And this also goes, so this is a difficult part of being sex positive in this day and age is the pornography, the fun, wonderful topic of pornography. Yeah. Nobody (laughs) wants to talk about that. I did a show on that and I think I offered to do it on another podcast and everyone's like, yeah, no. I know. It's so important. So I like scream it from the top of the rooftops or the mountains here in Colorado. (laughs) Yeah. So you've really got to talk about what pornography is and a really good way to talk about pornography with kids. Again, the positive and negative energy, you know, in my family, my daughter's not old enough. I mean, we talk about good pictures, bad pictures, but as she gets older, I really emphasize, you know, that the girls are, we like real things. We don't like fake food. We don't like fake things. Mm -hmm. Like we're too good for that. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds kind of, kind of strange, adding a little snobbery, like we're Gaudreau's and we don't do fake things. I'm sorry if you have fake flowers in your house. I don't (laughs) use fake, (laughs) I don't have fake flowers, you know, something like that, you know? Yeah. And when it comes to pornography, it's fake. Right. And we like real connections. We like real connections with real humans. And watching pornography puts a dark, negative energy out into the world. And I'm just going to say promotes pedophilia and human trafficking. So as adults, we've really got to get our heads around it as well. It's not just for kids not to watch. It literally 
fuels human trafficking and pedophilia. So if you have kids, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about sex positive, a lot of sex positive stores and places, you know, like you'll find on the internet are very pro pornography because it's a way to explore oh. your sexuality. Mm. I'm calling BS on that because the price is just way too high for you to explore your sexuality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Human- and I mean, research has been done on it, on what it does to children's brains. Oh yeah. It's and huge. The damage it does. And so my question is, and, and I love how you're talking about it because I talk to my, right now, just my boys, my girls are, are not really there yet, but, and that's what I want to talk to you is at what age do we start talking about pornography with kids? Because they're getting exposed younger and younger because it's everywhere. And so I talk to my boys about the same thing that of course, it's not real, that it damages people, that it damages you, that it actually is going to affect your sexuality and your ability to have healthy sex with mm-hmm. your partner in the future, and that it gives you a expectation of sex that's not real, and therefore you will be disappointed in the real thing. So yes, I love, I love that. Yeah. And one tip on that is kind of like an entry level conversation would be about addiction. So cigarettes, alcohol, Mm -hmm, that kind of stuff. mm -hmm. And just really what happens to the mind when there's these chemicals released. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like what we're talking about, why it's really important to have that attachment hormone with your partner. That attachment hormone can be released to your computer. And you get addicted to it. And there, there is addiction now. So talking about, you know, the cigarettes addiction and unfortunately, um, what's the new type of smoking that they do? The vaping. Vaping. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So vaping's like the new thing we have to warn our kids about because it mm-hmm. tastes like cotton candy or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but you need to talk to your kids about that. And then it kind of leads, there's all kinds of things you can get addicted to. And one of those is on the internet, bad pictures. And honestly, bad pictures of all kinds. Any of these images that go in your mind and the addiction to pornography is honestly more difficult because those images will never leave your mind. You can detox from substance, but you cannot get those images out of your mind. And most people, 99.9% of the population can tell you the very first time they saw pornography and exactly what that image was. Mm. Uh, It just will not go away and, you know, um, forever. Yeah. It's there. It's literally there forever. And then also going to art galleries and really looking, and this kind of goes back to the sex positive stuff is nudity in art is not pornography. And why, why is that not pornography? And kind of ex- exploring on the feelings that are induced by the artwork is different than what pornography is trying to produce. Interesting. I haven't thought about that, but it's funny because even this morning I was reading a book to my daughter called The Amazing You, and it's a really wonderful book for preschoolers, young elementary about your body and labeling your body parts anatomically. And oh, cool. It girls all about it. And it shows, and it's funny because my daughter is like, this is me now. This is, oh no, she said, this is the past when I was a baby. This is the present and this is the future. I'm like, good. Cause it shows when, you know, how you're going to develop as a, you know, as a girl or a boy both. And all of the pictures are all there, like full on penis, scrotum, vagina. And those thoughts went into my head too. It's like, you know, is this okay to be shown, you know, but I mean, they are drawn. It's not real pictures, (laughs) but yeah, exactly. So I love that you say that, you know, art and seeing naked bodies in art or like in these types of books, like I show her is not the same as pornography. And it does have a different effect on your brain. I think it's important in a way with the kids to kind of desensationalize the human body in that way. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, that person is naked and having like fine artwork out where people are nude in the sculptures, you know, and that's art and that's the body. And yeah. You know, it's really not that big of a deal. So just to kind of decrease the curiosity a little bit. Ah, yes. Because if, if you make it completely like, you know, for girls, like just the thought of a penis is just something you're never, you know, there's just, just curiosity mm-hmm. naturally. Or 
It is natural. And it starts so, so early, so early. But okay, so these are some really good tips that moms can take as they're, you know, really trying to be positive with their kids about their bodies and their sexuality, which starts, you know, I mean, we are born as sexual beings. We are. Yes. It's not something that just starts when we're 12, you know, or, or starts when we're 15. We are born as sexual beings and it's a part of us and it's beautiful. Just like you said, it is a beautiful gift. And so I would encourage moms to start with their kids super young, just like they have mm-hmm. books for two-year-olds and three-year-olds about your body. And they, I have a series of books and I can't remember the names of them right now that really just are all about, you know, kids and their sexuality through the ages, all the way through puberty. It's important. These are topics we need to be talking about with our kiddos. Yes. And I did a video for the IGTV, the new Instagram videos. So Mm -hmm. yeah, howtoraisemaverick.com on there. I did one about, I think we might have similar books. It'll be interesting to see. But, you know, I wanted to mention one other thing that's a hang up that a lot of women have is when there's curiosity about their periods. Um, Like kids find tampons and pads and stuff like that. And yes they're like, I don't even know where to begin. Mm. So you make it fairly broad. And then if they keep asking questions, you kind of let them follow. So my daughter found my tampons and she's like, what are these for? And I said, for when I'm bleeding. Mm -hmm. And and then she left it. Then she came back and she was like, when you're bleeding, where? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) all right. So then I said, once a month, I have what they call my period and I bleed through my vagina, from my uterus and my vagina because my body was preparing to have a baby and each month it prepares to have a baby. And if I don't become pregnant and some of it may go over their head and that's Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, lean on your books. Also just take it, you know, I bleed from my vagina. Why are you bleeding from your vagina? Because once you know, you can kind of, when the whys come, you can explain Mm -hmm. more, but that's a good example is you really need to be your child's source of information for sexual knowledge. Otherwise they're going to ask Google and it's going to put them at high risk for abuse if they don't know. Excellent point. They'll ask Google, which will put them at high risk or even worse, they will ask us, you know, a peer, which is just the blind leading the blind. But I love that you said that. And I do that with my girls too. My girls are always in the bathroom with me. So (laughs) it's like, I never try to hide anything. And they know even my, you know, my five-year-old, she knew about periods when she was probably three. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's like, and one day you will too. And it's a positive thing. And my 12-year-old is anxiously, you know, waiting for hers. (laughs) This is going to sound super, super weird. So I study botany as I'm like an armchair botanist. So I hang out with like crazy hippies a lot. Uh-huh. Um, so I, which is good. You know, I appear to conform, but I'm not <laughs> that far. Anyways, so blood is like one of the best fertilizers. Oh, yes. And right. So somebody was telling me her grandmother, she had had her period and she was horrified and she was upset and she was mad. And like, why is this happening to me? And mm-hmm. So her grandmother had her take like her, I don't know, her pad or whatever, like take it out into the garden and then they buried it with a plant on top of it. And her brother who he had his plants in the garden or whatever. And she's like, watch this as like an extension of the superpower. And so the plant just like blew up and beautiful and blooms and everything whereas his plant wasn't. And she was like, never see this as a bad thing. Oh, that is so beautiful. I love that. I'm going yeah, to that. I was like, I never know how people are like taking their blood out to the garden, you know? <laughs> Whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, it's so, it, it's a little That's weird. That's why I love I you, think, Zoe. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's so cool because it, it is affirming your child. It's affirming their body. And it's, it's what I always talk about reframing. You take anything negative and you can reframe it into a positive. And so I love, love, love that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to say is when it comes to answering questions from kids, really about anything, but we're talking about sex today. You know, one of my professors, we were talking about, and it wasn't even sex, it was a different issue about like, how do you answer your kids? And he said, you answer the question. You Because mm-hmm. a lot of times parents, a kid will ask a question like, where do babies come from? And parents get all freaked out and they feel like they've got to give their dissertation. Instead, right. just answer the one question they have because it's not the end of the conversation. You're not never going to talk to your kid again. And so, like you said, if you just say like, that's for my bleeding time, you know, it's simple. You just ask the question and she was okay mm-hmm. for the moment 
moment. Yeah. And then yeah. she thought about it. And then when she was ready for more, she came back. So we don't need to put more on our kids because we have all that knowledge and we're worried about what we have to say. Just simply ask the one question and know that it's the beginning of a lifetime of conversations. Yes. Yes. I had a friend who their daughter asked her dad, what does intercourse mean? And he just freaked out and you got to ask your mom. And she never asked her mom. So Aww. she wasn't asking how to have babies and what right. sex is. And I, I need to know exactly, you know, does the penis grow in the vagina? And like, yeah. like we just accelerate. She heard the word intercourse uh-huh. and had no idea what it meant and was looking towards him for Aww. knowledge. And it was like, oh my gosh, you got to talk to your mom. So obviously like there's a little bit of shame going on. And again, this is when you have your own trigger, feel it, sit in it for a minute and just say, hold on just a second. I'm thinking about something else, but I really want to answer that question for you. And just take a moment to like, just take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And like you say, answer the question, because if they learn that mom and dad is going to deflect, you are not going to be their source. And I want to say very specifically, predators have said, this is difficult, so I hope it's not a trigger for people, but if you give me a child who doesn't know about sex, you've given me my next victim. Absolutely. You've got to do it, guys. It's not an option. This day and age, we've been watching the news. We saw what happened in the Catholic church, Mm -hmm. uh, thousands plus kids. And this could have easily been avoided with casual conversations. It's positive. It's no big deal. It really is no big deal. Beautiful. And I think we will drop the mic on that one. (laughs) I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I know that this is, you know, this is a beginning of the conversation too, because we could probably talk about it forever. But I hope that this has been really helpful and useful for any parents out there who are kind of struggling and just kind of trying to figure out how am I going to, you know, do this with my kid. And hopefully they will follow you, check you out. I love the IGTV is really cool. So um, if you're on Instagram, check out, it's Raising a Maverick right on Instagram and we'll put up links. Yeah. Raising yeah. a Maverick or Emily Goudreau, G-A-U-D-R-E-A-U. It's a lovely Tough long name. name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's why uh, we can put it in the notes and you can uh, click on it. So yes. wonderful. Thank, thank you, Zoe. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Take care. What a great conversation with Emily Goudreau. I hope that it spurred you to, at the very least, just focus a little bit and be a little more intentional in developing positive attitudes about sex with your kiddos. So real talk time. This is Real Talk, where I answer questions from my listeners and I share my own musings and encouragement. Please reach out if you have some questions you'd like me to address on the show. All questions are anonymous. I take your confidentiality seriously as if you were my own client. And you can email me questions to Zoe at drzoeshaw.com or connect with me on any of my social medias. And this question was also curated from my column at the Grit and Grace Project. You can always submit questions directly to me by emailing me at zoe at drzoeshaw.com or you can go to Grit and Grace as well. Check them out. Great online magazine. So here's the question. This is from Curious. I grew up as a missionary kid and was abused by my missionary father, emotional, spiritually, and physically. Every girlfriend of mine had been sexually or physically abused. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. I was depressed for years. I dealt with my pain. I've healed and I'm forgiven. Now I'm married with two young kids and I run a youth ministry and the dance ministry. I hear and see it all. My question is, I don't have big emotions anymore. I don't cry when I hear someone's awful story. I feel for them and I want to help, but I can't cry or feel surprised. I just kind of feel numb. I'm not sure if this is normal or if this is something that means something's wrong. So curious. What you are describing is called desensitization. Our minds and emotions become desensitized to repeated information over time. I believe this is God's way of protecting us and protecting our minds and our emotions. Many people think that defense mechanisms are unhealthy, and they can be, especially when our main way of behaving is through our defense mechanisms, but our defense mechanisms are actually there to protect us. And even denial can be a really healthy reaction in certain circumstances. So 
you just have to recognize that sometimes we have those defense mechanisms, but it's not a bad thing. So I'm really sorry that you suffered abuse from the very man in your life who, number one, was most influential and who was also supposed to protect you and teach you what healthy love is. So kudos to you, though, for working on yourself and getting yourself to a place where you feel healed. That's awesome. You must have done a lot of work. Now, you're in an interesting place because as a child of abuse and possible secondary trauma that you might get from listening or talking to people who are sharing their stories, you've also built up your own wall to numb your feelings and protect yourself. But as a minister, you're in a helping profession. And so that's where people bring their pain to you as well. So yes, as you said, you hear those stories. My question to you is, Do you not have big emotions ever or just not in response to hearing other people's trauma? If you don't ever have big emotions or a healthy range of emotions, this could actually be an area of concern. And you could be battling some depression or something else that's impeding you from being able to connect with your emotions. Sometimes antidepressant medication too, SSRIs can do something like that as well. If you just don't respond as you used to or as others do when you hear people's pain, I would say this is expected and that nothing's wrong. Because in truth, you can't actually do your job well as a minister from a place of constant hurting yourself. So if you're constantly hurting for other people, you cannot do good work with them. You can't help them, which is part of your job as a minister. You have to have a healthy boundary system, which doesn't include falling apart at the devastation of others. I can relate to this because as a therapist, I hear the worst of the worst on a daily basis. Now, I've learned to feel sympathy, but not empathy. I don't cry or take these stories to bed or even these stories at home. I keep them in their place because it doesn't serve me, my family, or my clients if I am having the same emotional reaction as my clients do. So my only concern for you is that I get a sense that you seem to feel that abuse is something that happens to everybody, which could lead to some real trust issues in your relationships. So I wonder what the story is that you tell yourself about people in general and what story you are sharing, whether it's conscious or otherwise with your own children. So to answer your question, yes, your response is absolutely normal. You don't need to take in everybody's abuse story as your own. It's okay that you don't cry or feel severe emotions when you hear a horrible story. You don't need to cry. Your role is to be one of support, but you do need to explore whether it comes from a place of pain because you feel like you can't take anymore or if it comes from a place of health that you're protecting yourself. Regardless, all helping professionals need someone else that they can lean on. We were not meant to serve in a vacuum. We weren't meant to live in a vacuum. We were meant for relationships. And many of the people in service or ministry get burned out because they feel that they should be able to handle everything all on their own. And that is not true. I seek out professional help from time to time, and so should you. This is not a sign of weakness or abnormality, but health. You are an amazingly strong woman, and I know that God is using you to help others heal. I hope that you're sharing your story because it can be healing for others and yourself. So thank you for your service to our youth, and you've got this. If you're still struggling, uh, reach out. Ask some more questions. Thank you for tuning in to the Dr. Zoe Show. New shows go up on Tuesdays. Subscribe so you don't miss a show. And if you're interested in coaching or therapy or you just want to get a little more help, go to my website at drzoeshaw.com or any of my social medias at the handle Dr. Zoe Shaw, D-R, Z-O-E, S-H-A-W. Join my free newsletter by texting the word join to 38470. And I look forward to... Speaking, connecting with you wonderful ladies on social media throughout the week. Have a great week. You've been listening to The Dr. Zoe Show, redefining your superwoman with your host, Dr. Zoe Shaw. Don't forget to sign up for her monthly newsletters to get encouragement, tips, and skills for keeping your mind in the superwoman game. Connect with her now at www.drzoeshaw.com. 
tell your friends, and subscribe to her podcast on iTunes. Join us next time for another edition of The Dr. Zoe Show.